Yo, welcome back to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press. It's our segment where we take a look at the newspapers and, uh, you know, consider the stories making headlines and invite experts like Mr. Jide Johnson to analyze this for us, uh, make, help us make sense of it, you know, so you can make informed decisions. Good morning, Mr. Jide Johnson. Thank you for joining us. Good morning, Anita, and good morning, Osaru. Good morning, to you, sir. It's Friday. Yes, <laughs> you're always <laughs> excited on Fridays. <laughs> okay, let's begin with the Punch newspaper. We're discussing this later on on the breakfast, and it's about the doctor's strike. It says, doctors threaten strike, say FG not paying dead members' insurance. The writers read, families of our members killed by COVID-19 received nothing. We lost 17 of our members to COVID-19, 1,600 infected in the punch, and uh, doctors plan indefinite strike on March 31st, as well as candle vaccination suffers setback. Still on the front page of the punch newspaper, Senate summons Attorney General of the Federation over on audited immigration's account. CBN defends Naira with $5.62 billion in three months. Throwing 2023 presidency open, despicable, Ohanese tells PDP. At last, Aisha Buhari returns after six months in Dubai. Six Super Tucano jets arrive July, says presidency. Quara mother, four children burnt to death, husband hospitalized. ex leader alleges Mackinde's loyalists threatening to kill her. And uh, how Lamida received 1.35 billion Naira kickbacks into personal accounts. And that's by the EFCC. Gunmen kill four naval men, three policemen in Anambra State. And uh, the, about the hijab controversy, uh, Tesco orders 10 sh shot schools teachers to resume today. Those are stories on the front page of the Punch newspaper. All right, uh, we'll move to the uh, Nation newspapers next and see what we can find. Insecurity, IGP accuses states of non-cooperation. Federal government says that only abnormal approach can end insecurity. And also NSA pushes for traditional rulers' involvement. Also, Masari backs power shift to south in 2023. APC will retain power, he says. Uh, gunmen kill four policemen and three naval ratings in Anambra and Kaduna. We can also see on the uh, nation this morning, Aisha Buhari back home. External reserves dropped by $523 million in two weeks. Border closure failed to stop smuggling of arms, President Buhari laments. And, uh, good thing, you know, that this comes up, you know, so we can once again have a conversation about how uh, successful you know, we were with uh, closing the border for that long. Also this morning, spending $1.5 billion on refinery misplaced, says LCCI and others. Uh, I think also Atiko Abubakai also made a similar statement yesterday. 60 billion Naira drugs seized in two months, says the NDLEA boss, uh, Buba Marwa. And also um, Obasaki cleared of certificate forgery and caught OK Zararume for Senate. Those are the big ones on the nation this morning. And uh, let's turn to uh, the Nigerian Tribune. AstraZeneca safe for use. EU, WHO declare. PTF engages ICPC to ensure vaccine accountability. Lagos vaccinates 12,720 people in 48 hours. IGP uh, and AGF fight over prosecution of Ohakim. Two years after APC, PDP, others snub INEX demand for audited report of election processes and uh, INEX saying it will apply the Electoral Act. $1.5 billion to revive Port Hackett refinery, suspicious, and that's uh, Atika speaking. And more reactions troll FG's plan to revamp refinery. Mother, four kids die in a lorry inferno. And uh, FBI lists Nigeria among top 20 countries that lost $44.2 billion to cyber fraud in 2020. $44.2 billion to cyber fraud. That's how much Nigeria lost. And those are the stories we're looking at this morning on the, the Nigerian uh, uh, newspapers. Mr. Jide Johnson, there's so much big stories here. We're looking at the COVID-19 pandemic. We're looking at insecurity. We're looking at vaccinations. Where would you like to start? 
Well, let's start with let's start with the uh, doctor strike. They are threatening to strike because FG is not paying their dead members' insurance. If the living are seen, if the living are seen that their dead colleagues are not be adequately compensated and their family are not being taken care of while they are alive. What happens to their motivation? What happens to their morale? What happens to their commitment to their work? And don't forget that we are in the middle of a global pandemic. And this group of people are essential to us having a safe and a healthy community and a healthy life. And the federal government has refused to be there. The liberal deserves his wages. And I think that we shouldn't get to the stage in which doctors we shouldn't get to the stage in which doctors only get their basic needs being met by government two strikes. I think that we should fire at this, we should throw spotlight on this, and then the federal government need to, to be proactive at dealing with this. If you just imagine the children of the deceased and doctors, they are their education, their welfare, and the rest of it is at a state of comatose as a result of federal government not paying the dead insurance of their members. These are areas in which the National Assembly should be looking into. That's why we have legislature. They should turn their eye on this particular issue because they're the representative of the people. These doctors are from one federal constituency or senatorial district or the other. So I think this is an area that we must throw spotlight on and government needs to, 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 to really do something quickly and, and fast. It's an insurance, it's an insurance claim. So why are they not paying it? It's, it's, it's important. All right, Jenny Johnson, also um, speak on the... Related to that is a story on... Go ahead, please. Just go ahead. I'm with you. Go ahead, uh, uh, Mr. Johnson. Yeah. Related to that is the story of the AstraZeneca... Um, um, vaccine which the European Union and the WHO has declared to be safe. I think one of the challenges we have with the vaccination drive in Nigeria is a lack of proper communication on the part of the government. And what do I mean by that? Um, communication precedes everything. It precedes even human creation because God said, let us make man. That's communication. Human beings are product of communication. I think in dealing with pandemic of this nature, the kind of communication we had during the mitigation and the lockdown, and the reason why government suggests for us to lock ourselves down, to stay at home, to wash our hands, and um, to keep social distancing, to avoid touching our nose and our mouth. The communication was massive, but when you look at the issue concerning this vaccine, people always have misconception concerning vaccine in the first instance. And government needs to do a lot of things in correcting this misconception. And that talks about public health communication. They need to look at that. Uh, um, until United Nations came out, uh, European Union and EU, we are having different stories concerning the AstraZeneca um, vaccine being safe. And I think that's a welcome development that we increase people's confidence in taking, in taking the, the vaccine. But I think government needs to do more when it comes to correcting the negative impression and attitudes that we naturally have towards vaccine in this part of the world. It's a natural thing, it's an inherent thing, and you need communication. If you ever change communication um, to change to change that, I think the Ministry of Information, the National Orientation Agencies, and all other public information agencies of government needs to put their eyes on the ball and educate Nigerians, edu inform them, educate them, inform them, communicate with them, and motivate them to take um, the vaccine. So uh, we started on that uh, medical note. So let's go to the issue of insecurity. Now, it's, it, it's sad that the IGP will accuse states of non-cooperation. We accuse states of non-cooperation. When in the first instance, the IGP himself does not cooperate with the state. The commissioner of police is a member of the state security council, is a member by, by design, as a commissioner, you should attend the cabinet meeting of the state. 
but the governors on their own will come to that. Usually, yes, because all commissioners, is there in the constitution, all commissioners are members of the state cabinet. You, so, at the state level, the person in charge of the security is the commissioner. So, by design and by extension, all commissioners of police should be attending the state executive council. They should automatic. Their membership is automatic. But the reverse is the case. Mm -hmm. But let's come to the issue of that of the IGP. He said that non-cooperation. When the commissioner is responsible, the commissioner does not even take instruction from the chief security officer of the state, who happens to be the governor. He takes instruction from the IGP. In a situation whereby I don't have control over you, and then we'll be having mixed messages concerning um, who is in charge of security, you will not have cooperation from the state, um, from, from the governors or the security agencies within the state, within the confines of the state. And that's why people have clamored, and some of us have clamored for restructuring, that there's a need for the structure of the Nigerian police, the structure of the Nigerian army, the structure of some certain agencies, to be structured in such a way that there are levels of authority for people at the local level. There are levels of authority for people at the state level. There are look, uh, the authority should not be concentrated at the central level. Policing starts from the community. But when the authority for policing resides with the Inspector General of Police, then you begin right. to have this type of this type of this type okay, of problem. That's, that's um mm -hmm. on 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 let's, the let's issue let's also of, talk um, about something um, on the on the Nation newspaper this morning, and uh, it says uh, the uh, $1.5 billion uh, for the Port Harcourt refinery seems like it's a misplaced uh, priority, this, um, uh, and that's from the LCCI. Atiku Abubakar also in a tweet yesterday uh, shared his uh, concerns concerning that uh, news story about $1.5 billion for the Port Harcourt refinery. I hope I can quickly find that tweet. Um, but let's, let's quickly talk about that. I, I, I read somewhere where uh, it was said that Shell, Shell sued the refinery for $1.2 billion, um, that its capacity is is close to the two refineries in, in Paracot. I yes. think what we, what we have done with the Tecos is what we should do with the refinery. That's my that's my candid view. What we did with Tecos when we deregulated that sector and we allowed private Operators to participate. I think government needs to. You see, Obasanjo did turn around maintenance of that. Obasanjo administration did turn around maintenance. Uh, uh, Abacha's administration did turn around maintenance of the refineries. Um, Jonathan did voted money for this refinery. This present administration is voting money for this refinery. I think what we need to do is to sell off and minimize our loss, sell it up, take government eye of it, let agencies of government regulate it. Because how do you justify using money to maintain a facility when that money could also build a new modern refinery? That's when people begin to question. People begin to question the intention of government. Then all of a sudden, the team was not even subject to any debate. I'm not sure it's part of a 2021 budget, and then government just Voted money for for that. We can't we can't be taking ten steps forward and hundred steps backward. I think we need to close our eyes. What does not work? You minimize your losses. What does not work? You do away with it, and then you concentrate yourself on what you have energy. On. Government has no business in business except to regulate business because every business operated by government always operates as a loss. All right. So, Mr. Gina Johnson, there's a story that really caught my attention on the front page of the Punch newspaper, and it's an AFCC publication about how Lamido uh, received 1.35 billion Naira kickbacks into personal accounts. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, Anita, I can't hear you. I said there's a story on the front page of the Punch newspaper. It's talking about how Lamido received 1.35 billion Naira kickbacks into personal accounts. We're talking about uh, the former governor of uh, Jigawa State. And uh, 
he and his sons and companies of his, you know, the EFCC found out that they had laundered money, diverted it into personal accounts and companies that they created. I mean, we keep seeing the stories every day in the newspapers. Have, uh, uh, have, have, have you seen a pattern? There is a pattern that emerges when a major election is happening in Nigeria. I'm not holding brief for the governors. Uh, I'm not holding brief for Sule Labidu or the governors. We all knew how uh, uh, and governors operate our national treasury. Or oh. we seem to be uh, having slight connection issues with uh, Jide Johnson. Uh, uh, state treasury and national treasury. Yes, the state has about seven. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Anita, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Please so go on. We saw. Uh, I said that. Well, there is a pattern that emerges over the years. When the major election is, is, is around the corner, you see the anti-corruption agencies becoming proactive and very, very active and very, very vibrant. When it comes to it, you be hearing corruption story left, right, and center. You begin to ask yourself, where are they since all these days? However, I'm not holding brief for the governors. Because we don't have institution of checks and balances. The institutions are there, but they are almost moribund. Um, the state has to assembly in most states are just an extension in the governor's office. The governor sends for the speaker and the deputy speaker at his will, and he gets things done for them. The way we operate our government, it is easier for the chief executive officer of the state to put his hand in the cookie jar and add as many cookies as possible at any point in time without without being without being without being checked. If you look at governors over the years that have been prosecuted or taken to court, and we wonder what mechanism have we put in place to forestall the reoccurrence of such things again. But it seems the way the more things changes, the more they remain the same. Because I can't imagine if that is what Sule Lamido did, if that is what Ibori did, if that is what um, um, Dariye did, if that is what Alabasia did, and they got almost got away with it, and that system is still in place, and we have not put in mechanism to correct that, we we'll still hear any stories like this. And when the election is coming around the corner, which party or which interest? Because there are no parties in the first instance. You saw over the weekend, Wiki and then um, the former governor of uh, Imo State, there were a global dancing together. I've told people there are no parties in Nigeria. You only have political interests, you have political elites, and you have political leaders. They are not leaders, they are dealers. They right. deal with, uh, with our own interests, they deal with our treasury, but on a common, on a common, on a common interest. Right. So if we have a situation, Whereby these systemic things have not been corrected, it is easier for people to dip their hand in the cookie jar. We everything remains, everything remains the same. So ESCC becomes active, ICPC becomes active. When the interests of some certain dealers are affected, so we need to deal with these particular people now, and we use the instrumentality of the state to deal with them, but not to put in mechanism in place to stop people dipping their hands into the cookie jar. Because the same system that we have in 1999 is the same system we have in 2021. And with the exception of Dali and Alamasia that was arrested abroad, and the Bori too that was arrested abroad, give me an example, an example of one governor since 1999 that has been successfully prosecuted in Nigeria. Um, but... Give me an example of one accountant general that has gone to jail. Give me an example of, of one, um, one treasurer of the state that has gone to jail. Give me one example since 1999 to date. And if you look at money that we have lost into private covers as a result of not us building institution, but building personality. You know, the emphasis 
on who ex EFCC was more on the personality. On JD Johnson. Is that first train is young as the rest of it. So we continue to have that problem. JD, I'm, I'm not sure if you remember the, uh, the uh, Joshua Darier story. Isn't that something that we can mention as a governor who, you know, has gotten jail time? That's what I said. I said with the exception of Darier. Oh, oh, with the exception okay. of Darier and Amasia and the police case in London. I missed that. All right. Give me uh, where... example. In Nigeria, give me. You what? see, we destroy the issue with technicality. A governor was uh, accused of corruption. He got elected as a senator. Then the, he was sentenced to jail. And then we used technicality to throw away the case. And now that person is the chief whip. All right. Of we, we, we need to, we need to end it I remember um, doing, um, I can't remember this senator from Nigeria State. When he got up on the Senate floor and he said, most of the people I'm seeing in this Senate chamber were people that I'm arrested, that were criminals. I think his name started with me or something like that. He's a senator from Niger State, a former retired police officer. And he said, most of the people I'm seeing in this Senate chamber are people, are criminals that have arrested in the past. All right. And they quickly went to the an executive session. So the situation here. there, but we don't have systems to forestall that. You always have those accusations on All the right. pages of this Mr. Johnson. They only prosecuted the anti-corruption fight. Thank you oh. very much. All uh, right. Mr. Judah Johnson is basically <laughs> saying prevention is better. Yes, Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for your time on The Breakfast this morning. Have a great day and a beautiful weekend. Thank you, Anita. And thank you, Azari. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very Johnson. much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Absolutely. And we wish our viewers all over the world Thank you very much. And um, if you have opportunity, <laughs> make sure that you take the vaccine. It's important for us to protect ourselves and to protect everybody. All right. Thank, Thank you, you once very again. much. And of course, I uh, will say welcome back to the president's Wi-Fi Shabu Hari. Yes. Uh, as we take a short break I need, now. I need to vacate myself. <laughs> <laughs> take a short break. When we come back, we're going uh, to talk today in history. What happened on this day, March 19th, many, many, many years ago. We'll be back.